All right. There we go. Just had to get my computer all set up. It was acting funny. Um, we will go ahead and finish the material before the midterm today. Um, so our our general plan for this week is going to be that we'll have have lecture that'll be kind of a a short lecture with lots of practice on mechanisms today. Um, and then uh, today's lab is just going to be a review session. Um, so it'll be a chance for, for you guys to come get any questions ironed out that you haven't had a chance to ask yet or that you haven't that you just found as you were studying. And then on Thursday, um, you we will actually we will not meet for lecture. Um, you just have to at some point starting Thursday morning and um, ending at Sunday at midnight like a quiz normally you have to take your midterm test. Um, so your midterm which will follow fairly closely the structure of the practice test I sent out on on Thursday um, with the with the uh, idea that it's going to be an open book test in mind, there might be a few changes here and there to make it less um, less about concepts that you can just look up and more about things that you can explain or show me skills. Um, I don't know exactly what that looks for looks like for all the problems yet, but most of the problems are going to stay pretty much the same. Um, so I will. I will be finishing writing that up today and then um, and then it'll be all ready for you guys to start it on Thursday. And like I said, there'll be a two it'll be a two hour time block um, and then I'll pad 15 minutes on there for the technology side. Um, so timing wise, you should be trying to finish it um, in two hours so that you leave yourself enough time to take pictures and, and scan it um, and then upload it before the before the uh, quiz closes um so in and i it'll basically be set up where it'll be set up like a one question quiz and that one question will just have a pdf um the same way that i did for the homework um it's set up as a quiz instead of an assignment so that i can um set a time limit on it um but it will not be broken up apart into multiple multiple questions in the um in the quiz itself and one pdf for all of your answers is fine all right any questions logistically about the test the we can still the, um, go ahead you can still come to you with questions on thursday and friday during office hours yes yeah and you can you can ask questions during over the weekend but you you kind of are it's going to be kind of random whether or not i have a chance to to respond to them like most emails on the weekends right um so i would do your best to get all your questions answered by friday at four when i'm when i'm done with office hours or 3 30 um when i'm done with office hours so that you can be good to go actually i think it is four and it goes 2 30 to I don't remember which what my office hours are. It's two thirty to something. It's at least an hour, and it might be an hour and a half on Fridays. Um, any other questions about the practice test so far? Okay. Yeah. I'm struggling on doing that Newman projection with that uh, cyclopentane. Yeah, that's that one's a little tricky. Um, the so the thing with the there's a version of it in the textbook that might be helpful to look at. Um, oops. Um, the other thing to remember is that you're still going to be trying to keep things more or less. Um, more or less tetrahedral. So if you've got cyclopentane, each of these, it's going to be more or less planar. If it was totally planar, doing the Newman projections, not too, too tricky. 
because it would look like we just take this and rotate it and we'd get something that looks like mm, it's gonna look like a sideways y basically and then this would be the the three carbons that are not part of our Newman projection. And then our second carbon is gonna be connected back here. And because if we're drawing it totally planar, it's gonna be in a completely eclipsed structure. And if it was totally planar, this would be flat here. Um, but we know that things don't really want to be eclipsed, right? That creates torsional strain. And so if it's not going to be totally eclipsed, it's going to be more like one of these has to be sort of bent out of the plane. And so that's what makes it not totally linear. So it winds up looking more like this. And if I draw the line here, in red to indicate that it's those are the bonds coming from that back carbon. That makes sense. I was trying to do uh, two. I was trying to do two of those circular things, two Newman, whatever. Yeah, remember that the other one is going to be buried behind it. The whole no, point I mean, of the Newman projection I mean the, is that we're looking straight down one bond from one carbon to the other. So you're always going to have one carbon in front and one carbon behind. I was thinking like, more like two of those circular things with like you do with the cyclohexane. So we can do that with cyclohexane because you actually wind up with with two of the carbon bonds being perpendicular or sorry parallel to each other with with something that's not um, cyclohexane you basically can't have two of the carbon carbon bonds be parallel to each other right just the nature okay. of it being five sided means that that they're all going to be intersecting lines. Um, in theory, you could do that for a for cyclobutane, because you could have the two, two of the sides of cyclobutane be parallel to each other. Um, but that one winds up being having enough torsional strain to it that it doesn't, they're not still not even parallel there. But in general, we're going to be looking for one one set of these these circles, these eclipsed carbons, when we do Newman projections. Cool. And then I think the other thing I was rusty with was the uh, the resonance, but I don't know how much time you want to spend on reviewing this stuff. Um, that's we will review a lot a little bit of that today in when we cover mechanisms. Um, and then we can do more practice with that on uh, or in the review at during lab today. Sounds good. Any other questions on the on the lab though from last week? You know, also feel free to ask me any questions like that during this week's lab too. Um, I definitely have some questions about the lab, um, but I don't know what everyone. I want to like use our time well. So <laughs> we have a lot of time today. So awesome. Um, um, if you have a specific question, we can do it now. If it's more of a general, I, I don't know what I'm doing with Newman projections at all, um, then I'll, I'll, I would hold off on that. If it's specific, that's, that's the perfect time. <clears throat> okay, cool. Yeah. It's uh, question seven. I'm just struggling on where to start. I have every, like all my values and everything figured out. I just don't know. Okay, let me go to it. Um, Here, I'll, I'll screen share so everybody can see it too. As soon as I get it open. So for seven? Yeah. Okay, so, oh, and everybody did see the announcement, right? That you're, the numbers were off? Yeah. So if you got something crazy like 10 to the 34, that was, a, that was okay. Um, and probably what happened with that is either I gave you a geometry for the less stable um, T-butyl cyclohexane that, that wasn't optimized. So it was less stable than it should have been. It didn't have everything rotated so that the methyls were out of each other's way. 
um, which made it higher in energy than it should have been. Either that or the functional group or the basis set that I had you guys pick um, for the calculations overestimated the energy of one of the forms versus the other. Um, so that's that's a problem with the just with the assignment, um, not necessarily with the um, with the calculation itself or anything you can do. All right, so go ahead and ask your question, Olivia. So do we, is K gonna, okay. I mean, basically I just don't know where, like how do we, is it a constant temp and? Yes. Okay. So we, we can't do this without a constant temperature. And it's gonna be 298? Yeah, when, when in doubt, assume we're at room temperature and 298 is a convenient number to use for that. Okay. Um, yeah, I did not specify though. And then this is actually one of the reasons that we, that there is a calculus requirement in um, chemistry. And if you go into grad school in, in any of the sciences, um, you, let's say, I don't know about in bio, if you go to a PhD program in biology, but in most sciences um, or engineering fields, you have to take differential equations, which is basically how do I do calculus with variables that aren't X and Y um, and solve it in ways that are that you don't learn in Calc 1 and Calc 2. And so if we actually had something at a changing temperature, we would we could do something like find the change in K with respect to a change in temperature. Take the, we would be taking the derivative of this function with respect to temperature um, and wind up getting, and that would allow us to have a function here um, that's not a particularly you know, great function to take the derivative of. And if you guys have taken Calc 1 or Calc 2, you, or especially Calc 2, you know, it gets even worse if you try to integrate things, right? Taking the derivative, as long as you know the chain rule, you can take the derivative of anything you want eventually. It might take you a few steps. Um, but integrating sometimes is a lot trickier. Um, but so it's, it's uh, in general, we're going to be talking with, about things that are going to be at constant temperature. Um, because if we had a changing temperature, this whole, this whole equation, we need to treat it as, as a differential, um, which gets really messy. Um, so, and when in doubt, 298 is a good place to start. Okay, does that uh, satisfy your questions? I mean, it helps. I just don't like, I mean, I probably should have just come to you. So, I mean, not really. I don't really know what to do. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll give it one, one more stab here, give you something to think about. If you're still struggling with it in lab, ask again in lab. Sure. Um, so the general, what we're looking for in general for any time we're trying to use that equation k equals and sometimes for the sake of making it easier to write in one line you'll see e to the power of just written as exp um that's actually the function in excel if you want to do e to the power of something you do exp and then open parentheses um there's a negative delta e over rt so a couple of things to pay attention to is that delta E is going to be in joules, not kilojoules. So watch your units on that um, because R is in joules. But what we're really looking for for the delta E is going to be for some reaction or every reaction, there's going to be some potential energy surface that looks something like this. It might not be downhill in energy. It might be um, more than one step, but you're going to have some general sh shape of the reaction where you've got your reactants on one side and your products on the other side, right? So the delta E that we're talking about is just the change in energy between the products and the reactants. And so if you know delta E, you have a number you can plug in here and just make sure it's in the right units. And if you know R is a constant and you can just pick a temperature, we're gonna make the assumption that um, the that the enthalpy does not change with respect to temperature when the temperature changes, the enthalpy does not change 
which is a reasonable assumption as long as we're close, we're not at extremely high or low temperatures. Um, turns out if we really wanted to get an accurate number here, we would actually have to calculate the change in energy at 298. The calculation that you guys did actually was calculating it at zero Kelvin, um, but it's close enough for these approximations for now. Um, and so then, so we just wind up with an expression that's that's straightforward, plug it into the calculator and get an answer. The question is just what do you put as reactants and products? Um, and so that just depends a little bit on how you write your, your reaction out. If you write your less stable molecule as your reactants and write it as though it's going to rearrange to become the more stable state, then it should be downhill in energy, right? And if it's downhill in energy, and we're taking the negative of it, a negative of something that's downhill in energy, this becomes a positive number. And e to any positive number is gonna be greater than one. All right, so that's, that's what we're looking for. And it does depend on how you define it. If you switched it and you started from the, the more stable state, you're gonna get the same delta e, but with a positive number because you're putting energy into it. And in that case, your k is gonna be less than zero. Because when you plug a positive in here, a negative of a positive is a negative, and anything to any exponent as a negative number is going to be less than one. Right? So it all depends on how you define your system. Um, and there's not a right way and a wrong way. Usually, we would say that the reactants are going to be the less stable, unless we're, if we were doing some synthesis in lab where we had. Yeah, we had a set starting material. Um, then, then we're stuck with our our um, reactants being what they are. But if we're doing a, a calculation like this, we can pick whatever we want to be the the reactant and versus the product, and it shouldn't change your answer. You're just going to get one over the regular k. If you switch to this, if this answer gave us ten to the positive thirty four, when we did this for T butyl cyclohexane. If we switch the reactants and the products, we should just get something times 10 to the negative 34 or negative 33, somewhere around there, right? It's just gonna give us the opposite, the inverse of the K that we would get the other direction because we're essentially just switching products and reactants, right? And what's the first rule of equilibrium? Products over reactants. So if you switch product, what's products and what's reactants, you just switch what's on top and bottom of your fraction. <clears throat> All right, so hopefully that gave you guys a little bit more. This is exactly why I, I set that um, lab up after we had just covered equilibrium and, and energy and thermo because it makes you think about it a little bit as far as your definition of what's products and what's reactants. That's the, that was the whole idea. So good questions there. And something to the 10 to the times 10 to the 34th should set off red flags. So good job for those of you who brought that to my attention. Um, that that, I mean, sometimes we do see reactions that have um, equilibrium constants that high. But uh, like for instance, that's that's why with something like a combustion reaction um, that we we usually treat in Gen Chem, we would have treated that like it was going to completion, right? We don't treat combustion reactions as though they were equilibrium really. Um, and that's because their equilibrium constants are so high, we can essentially say, well, there's going to be no reactant left at equilibrium within sig figs. I think the, for a combustion reaction, K is like 10 to the 50th. So for every 10 to the 50 molecules of product, you get one molecule of reactant left over at equilibrium. Um, at that point, we might as well just say it's all product. And I have a quick question about the lab. Yeah. Um, for number eight, I think that's the problem where you draw all the uh, the conformers. Um, you want 12 drawings, right? Yep. Um, so yeah. by the time you finish number eight, hopefully you, you will have gotten very good at drawing your cyclohexane and putting things in axial versus equatorial positions. Um, I know that there was a lot of problem or a lot of drawings on Q8, but that, that was the point, right? Um, I will frequently use labs in this class to 
homeworks. It'll I'll fold in homework assignments basically as part of the lab assignment as well. And that's kind of what this one was. All right, anything else on the lab? Then let's start talking about mechanisms. All right, so mechanisms is where we, we left off at the end of, of class the other day. We started talking about um, electrophiles and nucleophiles and how positives, partial positives are gonna be attracted to partial negatives. Um, and we're gonna continue in that vein. Um, we're just gonna, we're gonna learn the conventions for drawing out the steps in a rea reaction. Um, and the, the main one is one that I already mentioned, and it's that um, when we are drawing mechanisms, when we're trying to show what, what bonds are breaking or being formed in a reaction, we are always going to show the movement of the electrons. Right? That was that Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Those nuclei are so big compared to the electrons um, that we can basically say that they don't move. And for those of you wondering a little bit more about that, remember that with um, with any so that so temperature. If we're talking about statistical mechanics, temperature is proportional to um, the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy of of the molecules, um, and that applies to all the particles within a molecule as well. Everything that's within a molecule has the same obeys the same rule. Um, so if you double your temperature in Kelvin, you're going to double the average kinetic energy of the molecules and of the particles within those molecules. And those of you guys who have had physics are pre probably pretty familiar with the equation for kinetic energy, right? At least a few of you have had or are in physics. It's one of the first equations you learn after F equals MA is kinetic energy is equal to one half mass times velocity squared, which if you think about this in calculus terms again, this is the integral of F equals MA. You take F equals MA, A is acceleration, it's mass over mass over, um, sorry, not mass, um, change in position over change in time. And if you take the integral of that, you get velocity. Or if you think about it the other way, if you take the derivative of this, you get F equals MA. You wind up with the, the two canceling out the one half here and you get mass times acceleration. Um, and this applies to all of the pieces of the molecule as well. And there's this mass versus velocity component to it. So if, if your nuclei have the same average kinetic energy as your electrons, but your nuclei are 2000 times larger, your velocity squared has to be 2000 times smaller. Well, Velocity squared has to be 2,000 times smaller. So when you square root that, you still wind up with your electrons moving, what is that, roughly 140 times faster than your nuclei. And that's assuming that, that's, that all of your nuclei are only as big as a proton. Right? So we wind up, that's, that's where we can, why we can say that is for everything that's at the same temperature, this holds true. And that means that we can actually roughly estimate how fast things are moving relative to each other. And with electrons being so small, the same, this is basically the same assumption that we said when we were back when we were finding out mass of different, um, different isotopes. We, I always told you as well, the mass of an electron is so small, we basically treat it like it's zero. This is the inverse of that. The velocity of an electron is so much bigger than, than a nucleus that we can treat the nucleus as though the velocity was zero. Um, so we're always going to be showing the movement of the electrons, which means when we draw all these arrows that we're gonna start drawing, um, we're always going to be drawing them from a, a bond towards a partial positive or from a lone pair towards a positive charge. 
because we're showing where the electrons are moving. And same with our resonance structures. With resonance structures, it kind of makes sense because nothing is moving except for the electrons, right? But even when we're showing new bonds being formed um, and new, new molecules being formed, we're still going to always show the electrons moving. I'm gonna harp on that, but that's, that's the number one thing. That is OCHEM 1's version of sig figs. The, the thing that I will mark you guys down on consistently and all the time is going to be when you do something like draw the arrow from a nucleus towards a negative charge. That's backwards. Don't do that. Um, and so the, but what I, I guess I, I didn't officially define mechanisms. Um, a mechanism itself is is trying to show all of the bonds that are either forming or being broken over the course of a reaction. We're going to do that by showing where the electrons are moving, right? Because all of these bonds are being held together. They're made of the electrons, the molecular orbitals, right? So we can take these these electrons and there's a, there are four basic patterns we can use that are going to that are going to show up in different orders and in different contexts to to basically make up most of the reactions that we'll see in this class most of the and i have examples for each one of these four so um don't don't have to scramble frantically to get them them written out we'll go through them all one at a time um but almost every reaction that you will see in this class is going to be some combination of these four steps. Um, and knowing which step happens first is part of the, the tricky part. And the other tricky part is, is recognizing which one of them is going to be more important at any given time. Um, and it's usually going to come down to tracking those negative charges, tracking where you have extra electrons and moving them towards partial positives. Um, that and recognizing when you have something that's unstable that will either break apart or rearrange itself to become more stable. So the most basic of these is called nucleophilic attack. And again, most of this is going to be written from the point of view of whatever has the extra electrons because the electrons are doing the movement. Um, and so a nucleophilic attack is just anything with a negative or a partial negative is going to be attracted to something with a positive or a partial positive, right? So these are the, the easiest um, patterns to draw is if, if you have a negative, you draw an arrow from the negative towards the positive. Um, another finer point of, of doing these is that the, um, the arrows for mechanisms have to be curved so that you can distinguish them from reaction arrows. Reaction arrows are gonna be straight. Um, they might be equilibrium arrows. They might be regular reaction arrows. Um, if we're drawing mechanism arrows, you don't have to switch the color of your pen, but you need to make sure they're curved. And again, that they're going from the electrons towards the positive charge. All right. So, and what we're really showing here is that we're showing the formation of a new bond. Anytime we have a lone pair moving towards a positive charge, we're going to be making, we're showing that there's a new bond that's going to form there. That's going to be this carbon bromine sigma bond that we just made. Um, if you're going to draw an arrow that looks like it starts at, it starts from a bond and does something like this, that's showing a bond being broken. If you're showing a bond moving, you're breaking that bond. If you're showing a lone pair moving, you're making a bond. At least I can't think of a time when you would show a lone pair moving that was not forming a bond. I'm sure I'll be able to come up with some exception in my head here in a, in a few minutes, but I think I'm safe in saying that. Um, if you're showing a lone pair moving, you're forming a bond. 
And if you're if you're showing a bond moving, you're breaking a bond. You might be breaking that bond and making another one simultaneously. But if you're showing a bond moving, you're breaking those that those electrons away. About like free radicals forming. That's that's a really good question, and that's another fine point here. And I'll re, I'll harp on this when we get to the free radicals chapter. Um, so to remind you, um, we if we have a the, the term we used in when we described that kind of bond was um, heter or homolytic. So if we wanted to show this molecule breaking apart into two bromine radicals, we actually show it with a, we call it a single barbed arrow going each direction. So that means one electron goes each direction versus if we had hydrobromic acid dissociating, we would draw a double barb going towards the bromine, towards the more electronegative element. And nine times out of 10, when we have a bond breaking like this, the electrons are gonna go with the more electronegative element. Whatever's more electronegative is going to hold on to those electrons. But if you have something where you've got the same um, strength on both sides, then you can wind up with a homolytic cleavage where we wind up with one electron goes with one bromine, one electron goes with the other. And we indicate that with the arrow type, with the, the barbs on the arrows. Um, so good, good question. Um, I'm, I'm trying to find a, a good analogy for physics or physics or math. Um, that's similar to how picky chemists are with their arrows, and I'm just, I'm failing. So I'll just to go ahead and admit, chemists are really, really picky about their arrows. Um, and something that uh, when you know all the rules, it's a really, really good shorthand for conveying a lot of information. You know, did you draw a regular reaction arrow or is it an equilibrium arrow? That tells you whether or not it goes to completion, right? Showing both barbs versus one barb tells you if it's a free radical mechanism or if it's a uh, heterolytic cleavage. Um, but it does take practice to get used to these. Um, so we will come back to free radical reactions um, in a few chapters. Um, I think that's this quarter. I think that's the next, the second half of this quarter. We're going to do uh, substitution and elimination and free radical reactions. So we'll come back to that. Uh, let me fix. Um, sometimes when we have, um, when we have a nucleophilic attack, we have to draw two arrows. Um, so sometimes that has to do with resonance. Most frequently, though, if you have to, if you have a nucleophilic attack. Um, if it's moving towards a partial charge, so this carbon here um, has a partial positive on the, the carbon that's being attacked, right? Um, because it's got, it's attached to two more electronegative elements. So this carbon's a good, a good target for a nucleophile. Um, but this carbon already has eight electrons on it, right? It's still got a full valence. If it has a full valence, you can't just bring in your nucleophile and attach it, or you'd wind up with a carbon that had five bonds. And we know that that's no good. Um, so if that's the case, if we're moving towards something with a partial charge, and that partial charge is a atom that already has eight electrons, we also have to break one of these four bonds that's around that carbon. Right, because we have to make room for the new electrons that are coming in. Um, and again, I'll make a, a generalization that has some exceptions, but almost always, if you're going to do that, if there is a pi bond, the pi bond is the one that you're going to break. Because remember, pi bonds don't have as much overlap as sigma bonds, pi bonds are being our double or triple bonds. And because those orbitals can't overlap as much, they don't have, they're not as strong as a single bond. So the sigma bonds are all so much more stable 
that if we have to break a bond, it's almost always going to be a pi bond if we have that option. If we don't have that option, then we have to have something like these electrons on the chlorine leave with the chlorine, and we actually just break off a piece of our molecule. Which brings us to our second pattern, which is loss of a leaving group. Um, and so a leaving group is exactly what it sounds like. A leaving group is just a part of the molecule that is relatively stable on its own and can just leave to make room for something else or to make a more stable, sometimes not even more stable, to make a relatively stable um, product. So in this case, this is the exact opposite of the reaction that I showed, a second, the, the mechanism I showed up here, right? Nucleophilic attract was brom bromide attacking a carbocation, right? But that's an equilibrium process, which means there's some possibility of this molecule reacting backwards. And so that's another step that you can have is um, you can wind up with some a more electronegative leaving group. It's usually more a more electronegative leaving group that brings electrons with it when it leaves. All right. So in this case, the arrow that we draw is just we draw the sigma bond moving those electrons to the bromine and then that turns it into we we broke the bond that was holding the bromine onto the carbon and so what we're left with is a bromine with all with eight electrons around it with a negative charge and then that carbon was tetrahedral did have eight electrons around it but now it only has six electrons around it so it has a positive charge. It actually has an empty spot in its p orbital. So we're making something that's less stable when we do this in this case. And we'll talk about the rules for carbocation stability and why this is considered a acceptable in some cases. Um, and part of it is just that it's we're making something that's unstable, but it's not that unstable. So it's uphill in energy, but there's some finite possibility that this actually happens. Maybe 0.01% of the time or something like that. Um, but leaving groups leaving is a really straightforward step here that can get, get us, can either get us to something that then can be attacked by a better nucleophile um, or that just moves us along our steps. This is not going to be the entire reaction because in general, we're not going to stop a reaction here because this positive charge is really unstable. We have a un an unfilled octet on that carbon. But this might be the first step in a multi-step reaction. Let's do um, a combination of the first two. Um, this is just a more specific version of nucleophilic attack and leaving group leaves. Um, and that's a proton transfer. If we look at the two arrows that are drawn here, this arrow over here above the equilibrium arrow, that's basically leaving group leaves except that it's leaving from a height from a hydrogen atom ion instead of leaving from a carbon. But that's very, very similar to what we just saw, right? We have H3O plus, then, and then the oxygen just keeps the extra electrons and you get a water molecule. A lot of times in OCHEM, organic chemists are kind of sloppy this way. Sometimes we leave off the byproducts. We have, we have an H3O plus acting as the acid, which means we need to make water as a byproduct here. Sometimes that doesn't get drawn. Um, but the other aspect of this is we, we're never going to have just protons floating around by themselves. H pluses are unstable enough on their own that they will find something that has a lone pair and they just stick to the lone pair. 
So we're never going to draw just some H3O plus breaking apart into H2O and H plus in this class. So you have to have something that's going to grab that extra H plus that we just made or are in the process of making. Um, and so that's that's why it's considered a proton transfer, not just dissociating. Is we're transferring the extra H plus from hydronium to the oxygen over here. And that gives us this product here, which is the protonated form of this carbonyl. So this, you guys see how that's kind of a combination of the two things we, we did before. Anything with a lone pair is going to be attractive to an H plus, and so it can. It's basically acting as a nucleophile. Um, and when we're comparing to carbon, pretty much any, anything with a lone pair is more electronegative than carbon. So there's going to it's going to have a partial positive. Sorry, excuse me, a partial negative um, on whatever atom has that lone pair. So nucleophilic attack, leaving group leaves at the same time, and we get a proton transfer is our net result there. And, and so we're always going to, it's whenever we're doing a proton transfer, there's always going to be like a, a molecule above an equilibrium sign. Always. It might be written as a reactant, but yeah, a lot of times, especially we'll, what we'll see in, in OCHEM is that there are a ton of reactions that are catalyzed by an acid but wind up over the course of the reaction, they'll give back that proton at some point. So you need the acid to start the reaction, You need, but then it comes back. And so that's why it's written above the arrows is because that's representing that this is a catalyst. And sometimes it might be more specific. Hydronium is sort of a general, um, a general placeholder for any acid. We don't know what the acid is. You can just write it as H3O plus. Um, but you will also frequently see it, a reaction written as, you know, HCl. And that, that's going to look the exact same, right? We're just, it will be the, the chlorine keeping the electrons and then, you know, the lone pair on, on the oxygen can go that way. Um, so the... It doesn't matter what the acid is, the proton transfer part's going to look the same, right? Um, an acid in OCHEM has to have a proton that can be broken off, um, at least until we get to Lewis acids. We can make that generalization. Um, H, H2SO4 is the other really common one. Um, sulfuric acid we see all the time in, in, as a catalyst in uh, organic reactions, and nitric acid as well. Um, those are three most common, are HCl, H2SO4, and um, HNO3 is nitric acid. Um, nitric acid doesn't get used too much because it's too strong. It, when you have too much nitrate dissolved in solution, you actually wind up making um, nitrogen dioxide, which if you guys remember doing the lab where we dissolved the penny or we dissolved copper wire in nitric acid at the end of Chem 101 last year, those of you guys who had it, and then it made this really, really brilliant blue solution at the bottom that was all the copper ions dissolved, and it made this really noxious red, red brown gas. You guys, we had to do it in the fume hood because it was makes such a nasty byproduct. Um, so we try not to use nitric acid too much because it's it's uh, really makes really bad byproducts, but we do still see it being helpful sometimes. I think we did that. That might have been the one that I cut out at the end, but usually we st you start with, with copper metal and then we dissolve it in nitric acid and we go through a couple more steps to make like copper hydroxide. And then at the end, we turn the copper ions back into copper metal by using aluminum foil. And you get this like powder, red powder, which is powdered copper metal yeah, um, at the end. One. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a stoichiometry yeah. lab, right? Because you can do a percent yield at the end. Look at how much copper you started with versus how much you made at the end yeah. and see what your, your percent yield was. Plus, it's a fun one. Everything changes colors every single step. <laughs>
um, which is, you know, what everybody wants from, an, from a chemistry lab, right, is things that bubble and change color. All right, let's look at the last common um, type of, of mechanism step here. Um, and then we'll take our break here in a second. Um, rearrangement is a little bit trickier. It's almost like resonance in some ways. Um, and resonance, you could consider resonance to be one of these steps too, because some because resonance can move a charge around, right? Um, and if you move a charge around, you can change what spots are attractive to a nucleophile. Um, rearrangement is similar to that, except we're actually going to move sigma bonds instead of just moving pi bonds or lone pairs. And so when you rearrange sigma bonds to make a more stable molecule, that's considered a rearrangement. Um, and so it can be something like a, if you had methyl cyclobutane, methyl cyclobutane is going to not be a very stable molecule, right? Cyclobutane is going to only have four sides. It's going to have a lot of strain energy. If you, but if you had methyl cyclobutane, you have enough carbons and hydrogens that you could just rearrange it to be cyclopentane. All of, you have all the same pieces and have the same molecular formula as cyclopentane. So if you have methyl cyclobutane, it will frequently rearrange itself to turn into cyclopentane just by moving a, a, a couple sigma bonds. You move a hydrogen over one spot, you move a carbon over one spot, and you go from something that's got a lot of strain energy to something that's got a much bigger ring and is a lot more stable. Um, and so anytime that can happen, that's called a rearrangement. Um, and the other, the most common one that we're gonna see in this class is going to be with carbocations. Um, we're gonna carbocations. We're gonna find are pretty common intermediates, and these steps will wind up with a lot of a lot of reactions where the first step creates a carbocation, which then will rearrange to become more stable. Um, and one of the reasons for that is um, if you have so if we have a if we have ethane that we pulled a hydrogen off of and took the electrons with it, so we made this carbocation. Um, by taking a hydrogen and the electrons off of, of ethane, that, that empty orbital is shaped like a p orbital, right? We basically don't hybridize. If, if you look at a carbocation, they're always going to be sp2 because we're not going to bring in that third part of a p orbital unless we have a bond we can make. So if you don't have a fourth bond, then your carbocation will stay as a p orbital shape. And if you have another carbon that's tetrahedral next to that, the tetrahedral sigma bonds of the carbon next door can actually kind of form like a partial pi bond. The shapes of those orbitals are similar enough that you can basically stabilize that partial or that positive charge by giving a little bit of electron density from the carbons next door. which means if we, can if we can have one carbon nearby stabilize that positive, what's gonna happen if we had two carbons? If we replace this hydrogen in the back with another methyl group, is that gonna be more stable or less stable? More stable. More stable. We're gonna be able to have this happen twice now. And if we have replaced all of the hydrogens with carbons, we could do that three times, right? winds up which would basically look like all three of these these other carbons would be able to give some electron density and kind of make a really really weak pi bond with that carbocation so the more carbons you have around a carbocation the more stable that carbocation is And so when we look at that, a methyl carbocation, it's gonna be the least stable carbocation because it doesn't have any carbons around it to stabilize it. 
If you have one carbon around it, that's a little bit better. Secondary, a secondary carbon, a secondary carbocation, meaning you have two carbons around the positive charge is even better than a primary carbocation. And a tertiary carbocation where you have three R groups around the positive charge is even more stable than that. And again, I'm, I'm, I don't think we've officially defined primary, secondary, tertiary. Um, primary, secondary, tertiary are basically our way of describing how many carbons are around something else. That's where T, the T in T butyl comes from. T stands for tertiary or a, in sec, in sec butyl stands for secondary. Um, so primary means you only have one carbon attached to it. Secondary means two carbons attached. Tertiary, three carbons attached. Does anybody know what the next extension past tertiary would be in using this naming? Is it kind of an esoteric. What is it, Cody? Is it quaternary? Quaternary. Quaternary would be the fourth level. Primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. We can't have a quaternary carbocation, right? Because that would be four bonds to the carbon, which means the carbon can't have an empty p orbital. You can't have a positive charge on a quaternary carbon. So we mostly will stop at tertiary. You actually will hear people um, in biochem, sometimes you hear um, people discuss different medications as being quaternary amines. A quaternary amine is a nitrogen with four carbons attached to it. So that means that that nitrogen is going to have a positive charge because nitrogen needs three bonds to be neutral. So you'll hear things like quaternary amine salts or something like that when they're describing different kinds of pharmaceuticals. Um, but generally, we're going to stop at tertiary for OCHEM because we're usually most interested in things that are happening. If you have a quaternary carbon, nothing really happens to it. It's pretty stable. Um, the practical side to this is if we can move towards a more stable form, we can actually wind up switching a sigma bond over. Because remember, we had some, and go back for a second, we had some orbital overlap between a sigma bond and an empty p orbital, right? That's what makes it more stable as you add more carbons around it, right? Well, if you can have a little bit of your electron density being donated and, and overlapping here, if you can move the positive charge to a more stable carbocation by just moving a hydrogen over, that or orbital overlap actually winds up switching the entire bond over one spot instead of just giving a little bit of its electron density to make this secondary carbocation more stable, it can wind up giving up all of its electron density over to the secondary carbon because then what we left behind over here is now tertiary. So if we can go up the rung, up the ladder here, to become more stable by moving a hydrogen, that's, that's our most common form of rearrangement, is either if you have a primary carbocation, it can rearrange to make a secondary carbocation. If you have a secondary carbocation that can rearrange to make a tertiary carbocation, it does. Right? And it takes a little bit of practice to be able to see this, and you have to have a carbon or a hydrogen to move over, right? But basically what this is going to do is if we can move something small, a, a small sigma bond, usually a hydrogen, we can also see this with methyls sometimes. If you can move one sigma bond over to make your product more stable as a carbocation, we do. 
and we'll practice with that when we come back from our break. Let's come back at, at five after, and we're going to practice identifying these steps, and, and then we'll practice drawing them once you can recognize them. <laughs> 
So wouldn't you know it, but the top post on the chemistry subreddit today happens to be nitric acid plus copper. So this is what, what happens. We didn't use a penny, we used wire, but there's that red brown nitrogen dioxide gas that I was talking about. You can see the, the green and then it'll turn blue coming off as the copper ions um, being formed from the copper metal. Copper ions are either blue or green depending on whether they're plus one or plus two. There's that really nasty carb, uh, nitrogen dioxide gas. Um, fun fact, a having too much nitrogen in a gasoline source um, is what led the skyline of Los Angeles in the late 80s to look brown as it did. Um, nitrogen dioxide is a is a main component of smog that you get without catalytic converters um, if there's too much nitrogen in your fuel source. And since there's always small amounts of nitrogen in your fuel source, that's why catalytic converters are so important, um, especially in areas with lots of internal combustion engines. Um, it doesn't always look like that. Like if you look at Beijing um, during the, uh, the Beijing Olympics and remember how, how gross and smoggy it was, um, but that was sort of like a gray smog. Um, it's because they didn't get their gas from the same source and gas and petroleum refining techniques had gotten better. So there was less nitrogen in it. Um, and so they had more other pollutants instead. Um, and you can actually look at the absorption spectrum of different of pictures taken in different cities. You can actually identify the city based on the fingerprint of its smog. Um, if you, if you just look at how it absorbs the visible light um, and you can actually date something that way as well. You can tell if, if you know it's Los Angeles, you can tell when the picture was taken just by looking at how, how bad or what color the smog is. Um, kind of gross, kind of makes it clear that humans do in fact influence their environment in significant ways. Um, if anybody was still on the fence about that, I think you guys are all past that point. All right, so the if you've looked at the last two questions on the test, on the practice test, um, they're variations of what we're going to go over now. So for right now, don't take this personally. You guys don't know enough to write your own mechanisms. Um, however, if I show you a mechanism, um, one of the skills that I want you guys to have for this midterm is to be able to tell me what type of step it is. Is it a proton transfer step? Is it a rearrangement? Um, is it a leaving group leaving or a nucleophilic attack? So identifying and putting, putting something into one of those four categories, and we can throw resonance in there as well. Um, if a resonance can be a step in a mechanism, potentially, um, because it moves a positive charge from one place to another. So that can make it a good place for a carbon, for a nucleophile to attack if you move a positive charge around with a resonance step. Um, so if I show you different mechanism steps, including what the products are, I want you to be able to look at these and, and be able to identify, okay, that is a proton transfer step or that is a rearrangement step. Um, worth noting, where did the... All right, we'll talk more about rearrangements here in a few minutes um, and why they, why they happen. I thought they had that all together here, but it's after a couple practice problems. Um, so if I give you these steps, we just wanna classify. So for A, we have a carbon hydrogen bond arrow drawn towards a positive charge. And then when we look at the product, the positive charge is moved over. In other words, the hydrogen moved to the right. We moved a sigma bond towards the right hand side to make a more stable carbocation. So that if we're looking at this and trying to assign 
um, what type of step that is, that'd be a rearrangement. And how about, I, for whatever reason, I go vertically when I do these. Let's do C next instead of B. We have a nucleophilic attack on a hydrogen. And then a set of electrons stays over here and we wind up making a new pi bond. But we have a two step mechanism here, right? We have, and it's not just a straight nucleophilic attack because that the target of the nucleophile is a hydrogen ion, which is then moved from one molecule to another, which makes this proton transfer. So if you wind up, proton transfer is going to be one of the easiest ones to recognize because it's usually going to involve two arrows and you're always going to wind up, um, you need two molecules as well. If you have, and then if you can recognize that one of your reactants and one of your products are a conjugate acid base pair, that's almost a dead giveaway. As soon as you can recognize that you, oh, I started with water and I made hydronium. That's the conjugate acid when water's a base. As soon as you can recognize conjugate acid base pair, that's almost certainly gonna be a proton transfer. How are we doing so far? one of those things where it's easy enough when I do it, but if I turned you loose on some of these, you might have a little bit of an issue. I'll do one more and then you guys do B and D. I'm just confused. Um, the at H on the hydronium, you, it just acquired it from the environment. It acquired it from this carbon molecule. So if you look at the bonds that are being made and, and deleted here, this sigma bond that was holding the hydrogen on is being broken. Those electrons are moving over towards the positive charge here. So there's no longer a bond between this carbon and this hydrogen. So okay. that the extra H plus is coming from the carbon molecule. Why wouldn't you draw the arrow on the, the hydrogen going the opposite direction if it's forming hydronium? I guess I'm just. So remember where the arrows are showing where the electrons are moving and the hydrogen is not more electronegative than carbon. So the hydrogen is not going to take the electrons with it. So the hydrogen, when we break that bond, whatever's, well, anytime we break a sigma bond, whatever's more electronegative is going to keep the electrons. And that means that when you pull a hydrogen off of something, it's never going to take its electrons with it unless it's attached to a metal. We'll see that eventually. But for now, hydrogen's always going to get moved around as an H+. Plus. Um, but you are also on the right track with the, did the hydrogen just come from the environment? We will frequently see in organic mechanisms, and I'm, trying, I'm going to try not to do it to you guys till you're a little bit more comfortable with mechanisms. Um, but just a water comes out of nowhere sometimes in OCHEM mechanisms because there's always some water around. And so sometimes we'll just have a, re a mechanism going and I'll just say, and then let's throw a water in there too so that we have something that can take a proton. Um, so that will happen, but for now, I'm gonna try to be really explicit with, with where everything's going and coming from. All right, let's do, how about E? So our Four categories, we've already got two, were rearrangement, proton transfer, leaving group leaves, and nucleophilic attack. So for E, 
we don't have a nucleophile attacking. We don't wind up having any hydrogens moving around. We're breaking a sigma bond, but it's not a rearrangement because we're not making a more stable version of the same molecule. That means our last option, and again, this is going to be one of the easier ones to recognize once you start to see it, is leaving group leaves. Right, we started with a molecule that was relatively stable where we had all these bonds, everything had a full valence, and then our, a more electronegative element um, just pulls the electrons with it when it leaves and it just breaks off of the molecule. Um, leaving groups leaving is usually gonna be a single arrow. And there'll be some of these where we can actually combine a few of these steps, but we'll get into those examples <clears throat> in a little bit. Um, but if you wind up, I'm trying to think if I can, how many, if you can count the number of sigma bonds before and after, and you get the same number of sig sigma bonds, then one of two things happened. Either if you have the same number of sigma bonds, it was either a rearrangement or proton transfer. Because a nucleophile attacking is going to make an extra sigma bond. We have one more bond than we started with. In leaving group leaves, we have one fewer sigma bonds than we started with. Right, so that's that's another sort of dead giveaway. If a leaving group leaves, by definition, we have but one less sigma bond. If a nucleophile attacks, we're going to ma be making a sigma bond. And if we get the same number of bonds before and after, it was either a proton transfer or it was a rearrangement. All right, so how about B? Is it a nucleophilic attack? Yeah, a couple of you guys said it at the same time. Cool. Yeah, no, no, that's that's what I want. I, it's um, Zoom classes are weird for me because I like when there's noise in the classroom. You guys that have had me before in person know that. Um, so I don't mind that at all. Um, if it bothers you, then just put it in the chat. Um, yeah, so anytime you can point to it and say, OK, a partial negative, I'm going to take a lone pair or a, a negative charge and I'm going to draw an arrow towards a positive charge or a partial positive charge. That's nucleophilic attack. And so the this arrow of, of proton transfer is kind of like a nucleophilic attack, except that there, our, nucleophil, our nucleophile target is a hydrogen. With proton transfer, that's always going to be the case. It still looks like a partial negative attacking a partial positive. But if it's proton transfer, the target has to be an H plus or a hydrogen. If it's anything that's not an H plus or a hydrogen, then that's going to be just nucleophile attack. You guys see how they're really similar steps? And then how about D? rearrangement this one could you could kind of fit into two categories it's it's tempting to call it rearrangement um because it's in the same molecule right and our rearrangements were always new ways of drawing bonds in the same or in the same molecule to make it more stable um and this so this could be considered some form of rearrangement it's a little bit more accurate to also call this one nucleophilic attack. It's just that the nucleophile and the positive charge are in the same molecule. 
right? So if it was a rearrangement, we'd be breaking one sigma bond and making a new one. Here we're making a new sigma bond, but we're not breaking a sigma bond. Right. So again, this and this is sort of like um, you know when I have when I ask multiple choice questions in GenChem sometime or like is it a homogeneous mixture or a heterogeneous mixture and you know it's, well it depends on how how far we zoom in right milk looks homogeneous until you zoom in enough that you can see the individual fat droplets and then you realize it's really heterogeneous um, this is one of those where there are some that are cut and dried but there are some questions like this where you could justify one or more depending on how you define a rearrangement if you count a rearrangement as just moving electrons within the same molecule to make that molecule more stable then d fits your criteria for a rearrangement as well if you say that it has to be a sigma bond then it's not really a rearrangement step but if you on a test if you wrote rearrangement and said because you're making it's all happening within the same molecule, it wouldn't necessarily be wrong. I could at least give you most of the credit on that one. All right. So explain your logic when you're in, when in doubt on these. Like if you looked at a proton transfer step and you called it a nucleophilic attack in a leaving group, well, you're not wrong. We just have a better name for for that when your target is a proton. So here's one good way of doing in this, another practice, and this is going to be something like what your exam looks like. I give you a multi-step mechanism and you identify each of the steps along the way as being either leaving group leaves, nucleophile attacks, proton transfer, um, or rearrangement, maybe with resonance thrown in there. So in this, in this example here, so here's the overall reaction is what's drawn at the top. We know that if we put hydroxide with, this is an ester, if you remember learning our functional groups, um, we wind up turning that ester into a carboxylate ion and you wind up making an alcohol. Um, this process is called saponification. This is actually um, the process uh, that they talk about for making soap in Fight Club. Um, they take fatty, they take uh, esters in the form of triglycerides, which are fats, and they treat it with lye, which is either sodium or potassium hydroxide or a mix of the two. And that breaks apart the esters to make carboxylate ions, which are hydro are um, amphophilic, meaning they have a, a hydrophilic side and a hydrophobic side and the alcohol that goes with it. And they were trying to make the alcohol that goes with it that they could then turn around and use to make nitroglycerin, right? Um, a few, not necessarily all of you have seen Fight Club, um, but, uh, and then, but the other side effect is making that long fatty acid chain that's deprotonated, which is soap. Um, but this step has multiple, or this reaction has multiple steps here. Um, one of which, the first of which is shown here. And so if I draw these out, we have something with a negative charge being attracted to a carbon that's attached to electronegative elements. So this carbon is going to have a partial positive. And we have a negative attacking a partial positive, which tells us it's what type of step. Nucleophilic attack. Nucleophilic attack. Yeah. And so, and if we're counting number of sigma bonds, we wind up making a new sigma bond when we did that, right? At the expense of a pi bond, we had to break a pi bond to make room for it, but we have an extra sigma bond now compared to where we started. This next step, these arrows, we have an oxygen taking electrons and breaking off. And then we have these, a lone pair moving down here to remake that pi bond. 
So this is two steps happening at the same time, but electrons moving to make a new pi bond to fill a valence is not, was not really one of our possible steps, right? But what step was it that looked, if we can point to at least this part. Is that a leaving group? We've got leaving group leaves. We wind up with one fewer sigma bond now. So leaving group leaves, and we'll frequently see that when a leaving group leaves, either it's going to leave behind a positive charge on a carbon, because you're going to bring the electrons with you with it, or if that carbon has a lone pair on the atom next to it, that one of those lone pairs will move over to remake a pi bond, because that's more stable than having that carbon have an empty spot in its p orbital. Right, so frequently with a leave, when a leaving group leaves, we wind up with making a new pi bond at the same time. But you wouldn't call that a nucleophilic attack? No, because it's already that oxygen's already attached. It's more like resonance. We're just moving the electrons, not any nuclei. Then, so we have nucleophilic attack, leaving group leaves, then when that leaving group leaves, it actually makes a strong base. It's not hydroxide, it's a different base than hydroxide. Um, but what do strong bases do? They attack hydrogens, right? Negative charge attacking a proton. And then the oxygen keeps the, the lone pair or the uh, electrons that were in the bond. So we wind up making this ROH, this alcohol molecule, which tells us that we're, this is a proton transfer step. So proton transfer steps are a little complicated, but at the same time, they have lots of factors that are, that are really distinct. If it's a nucleophilic attack on a hydrogen, it's a proton transfer step. There's just, there's always going to be another arrow associated with that because this hydrogen can't have four electrons around it. Same reason that carbon can't have five bonds. Hydrogen can't have two bonds because it only has two electrons in its valence. So if you have something attacking an H plus, the other electrons have to leave. So you're never going to see an arrow from the H because you're tracking electrons. Exactly. And it's tempting to do that when you have hydrogen just leaving a molecule. It's tempting to just say, oh, the hydrogen molecule goes over there. But that's not what's happening. You need the electrons moving towards the hydrogen, not the hydrogen moving to the electrons. All right. Another way I can ask this would be to do something like write the net reaction. If I give you an overall mechanism, writing the net reaction is basically what do you start with and what do you end with? Because anything that you make in the first step and then use in the second step is going to get canceled out. But let's start by doing the identifying the patterns here. First step, we have lone pair attacking a carbon that has a partial positive. So that is a that would make this water molecule a nucleophile. So this is a nucleophilic attack. And again, we have to have the two arrows drawn because we have to make room for that nucleophile to come in here. So nucleophilic attack. Then we wind up breaking a piece of that molecule off. We have everything attached together at the same time here, and then the chloride leaves, which sometimes in OCHEM we just wind up it's written something like a a uh, like it's a catalyst 
if you see a, a minus in front of it, that's just saying that we lose a chloride, minus chloride. So that's basically saying that this piece of the molecule is breaking off, which means it is leaving group leaves. Right, and then so that we don't have to keep putting plus chloride. So technically we would need to write this for all the rest of the steps, right? But to get around that, that's why we just write it like this. This is just saying we lose a chloride from our organic molecule. And for the most part, we don't care about things that aren't organic in OCHEM. So this is, we just basically say, poof, it's gone, it goes away. Then our last step here, we have water acting as a nucleophile again, but it's attacking a hydrogen, which is gonna give us a proton transfer step. All right, and this is gonna be a really, really common, and they call it a, a um, motif, just like in, in an English class. Um, motif was a really common reoccurrence of plot line, right? Or like um, archetypes of different stories, like, you know, young kid finds mentor, loses mentor, um, has to avenge mentor, like Star Wars, right? Um, it's, we call them, we call them motifs in, in OCHEM as well. It's really, really common steps. Nucleophile attacks, leaving group leaves, proton transfer, um, it's all just a matter of how you arrange those and what those different nucleophiles and leaving groups are that determine what the various reactions turn into. Um, if you ask Erina or anybody who, who had um, OCHEM last year, um, once you get into OCHEM 2, we will cover, we'll do like three mechanisms a day, but they're all the same mechanism really. They just have different names because you started with an ester versus starting with an acid in that, but it's the exact same steps, right? So recognizing these steps and making them make sense to yourself is a, is a big part of, of this class. So what would the overall reaction be here? We had this molecule in acyl chloride. Can you keep both? waters on the reactant side for your net um so we wouldn't have if we we would have two waters on there initially right except um so we'd have this acid chloride plus two waters one of the waters turns into this oh group that's attached the other water turns into h3o plus right so our net reaction would be our acyl chloride plus two waters will turn into the carboxylic acid plus H3O plus. And don't forget that chloride that was there. And so sometimes we'll actually see this written as acid chloride plus water and goes to plus HCl. But if you have HCl dissolved in water, that's really hydronium and chloride is more accurate, but this is a, a neater way of writing it because you only wind up with two products instead of three. Um, either one of them would be fine for this class if we wanted it to look like this, when we drew our reaction steps, instead of having the water act as the nucleophile in this last step for the proton transfer step, if you had chloride, the chloride that we just made over here, we could have chloride act as the nucleophile in our proton transfer or the, as the base in our proton transfer step. And then that uh, writing it this way makes more sense, right? This way is a little bit more accurate as to what actually happens if you have water around 
um, this will be the more common way of just because water is a better base than chloride is. Um, and we can start getting to more common or more complicated looking things, um, but it doesn't change what the, what the different steps will look like. If we zoom in on just one step at a time, it doesn't matter what OTS is. All that matters is that it's got a proton that's being attacked by an oxygen here. So regardless of what else is going on, we know that this first step is a proton transfer. And then if we're looking here, we have electrons attaching over here. We have electrons moving over to make a new sigma bond. And then we're losing an H2O molecule. This one would be leaving group leaves. Um, and if we're, would that if we're be really being careful, go ahead. Would that be a rearrangement too? Or nucleophilic attack? Because these these electrons in the benzene ring could be act are acting as the nucleophile as the water leaves it's going to leave behind a positive charge on this carbon. So this is leaving group leaves and nucleophilic attack happening simultaneously. Which could be classified as leaving group leaves and rearrangement, the way we were talking about it before. It's a little bit harder to see a pi bond as a nucleophile because we wouldn't look at this benzene ring and say that it's got a negative charge anywhere on it, right? But it has, it does have extra electrons. And so it's not just having the negative charge, it's also having extra electrons means it can be a nucleophile. Which means then we've got a positive charge here on the carbon that didn't make the new sigma bond, we broke this pi bond into a new sigma bond here, but that left a positive charge on the carbon that we broke the pi bond from. And if we move over a sigma bond, we can move that positive charge over one spot. Actually, this is not, that's not what's happening here. We could have a rearrangement here, but if we have water around that can be a base, we'll get another proton transfer here. We're gonna remake a pi bond at the expense of a carbon hydrogen sigma bond. So the oxygen grabs the proton here that those electrons move over back towards that positive charge. And we wind up remaking the benzene ring. So this would be a proton transfer step because we have something with a lone pair attacking NH plus. So when you look at the overall reaction here, all we really did was we lost a carbon hydrogen bond and turned the carbon hydrogen bond into a carbon carbon bond. And we lost the, the water here. So our overall reaction would be this starting molecule turns into our final molecule plus water plus H2O technically as well. And that's that, or sorry, H3O plus. And that's that uh, acid acting as a, as a catalyst. We start with something that can give up an H plus, and then we wind up making an extra H plus at the end. All right, here is the more the trickier way. Once you get get good at recognizing the patterns when I draw them, if I give you the reactant and the product for a step, I want you to draw the arrows. 
And eventually we'll take those training wheels off and I won't give you the steps in the middle at all. And you'll have to draw the steps in the middle. Um, but for now, your training wheels are, I'm giving you the product and the reactant for each step. So you have to look at them, recognize what's different and figure out what arrows you need to draw to get from this molecule on the left to the molecule on the right. And once you guys looked at this, actually, I can do that. I can use this form. That's not what I want. So what type of step is this first one? Just looking at products and reactants. Proton transfer. Proton transfer. Our product looks the same as what we started with, except we added an H plus to it. So what that would look like, especially if I'm trying to keep everything consistent spatially, really these, these two oxygens are identical to each other, right? They're both at the end of a carbon chain. So two aldehydes, I could pick any lone pair that I wanted to draw um, this arrow, but for the sake of making it look like our next step here, spatially, might as well keep it consistent so we don't confuse things. So lone pair attacks that H plus and the H3O plus, the oxygen keeps those electrons. So we make a water molecule and add an H plus to our starting material. Then once we're, once we're through that, ignore what came first. We're just taking this one step at a time. Our next step here, if we're trying to look and identify what's different, it's something's happening at this carbon, right? This carbon, which has a partial positive here, the oxygen's got a full positive charge, but it's oxygen. So it's not going to, to be a good target for a nucleophile. This carbonyl here, this carbon has still has a partial positive because it's attached to a carbon, or sorry, an oxygen. So our next step is water acts as a nucleophile. And you can make your arrows as convoluted as you want to, to make them so that you can show it attacking the right way. You could also just show it going like that as long as you're pointing to the right carbon, doesn't matter which one of those you draw. But we then need, we can't just stop there, right? Why not? Is that get us to this product? And that you have to break that pi bond. We have to break the pi bond. If you're if you're doing a nucleophilic attack to a carbon that doesn't have a charge, you're always going to have to break a bond to do that, right? Because otherwise, you get a carbon with ten electrons around it. Um, and if one of those bonds is a pi bond, that's the bond you're going to break. And now we have something, the oxygen that had the positive charge now only has two bonds. So it's just an OH and it's stable. The oxygen that just attacked now has three bonds. So it's got the positive charge. This looks really complicated, but this is just the results of a nucleophilic attack. 
All right, everybody with me so far? I'm trying to walk that fine line between going going really slow and and uh, and going too fast for you guys to keep up or have a chance to ask questions. And we're almost done. I'm not going to draw the arrows. We're going to go fast through the rest of these steps here so that we can go because there's one one more slide I want to talk about first uh, before we're done today. Um, what kind of step is this? Proton transfer. Proton transfer. We had a oh wait, we had a water molecule attached, right? And then we went to having two OHs attached instead. So we took a proton away from this this uh, group that had this oxygen that had three bonds. And then we do it again. This looks a lot like the first step, right? Except now we're attacking the other carbon oxygen double bond. So we have another proton transfer happening. And then another nucleophilic attack. Our nucleophilic attack, our nucleophile is just going to be one of these oxygens though. This is actually, this is what happens to sugars in your body or in any acidic conditions. Um, sugars that are present in their ring form will open up to form these um, more complicated looking molecules and then switch around their stereochemistry. And they're constantly breaking that ring structure for glucose or fructose apart, and then reforming with these, these rings, with these nucleophilic attacks within the same molecule. Um, because sugars are just full of lots of carbons and OH groups attached to carbons, usually with at least one carbonyl attached. So that's actually why there's two forms of glucose. There's the, the ring structure of glucose and the open chain form of glucose because this reaction, all of these steps are equilibrium steps. So at, um, in uh, physiological conditions, this is constantly forming and, and breaking apart the ring form of glucose using these mechanism steps. All right, the last thing I wanted to show though um, is another finer point of rearrangements because rearrangements are one of the ones that are trickiest to, to think about at this point. Um, and the first example the, that I showed you guys was what's called a hydride shift. So remember I'd on the end of something meant that, that it had a negative charge, right? So a hydride is a hydrogen ion with a negative one charge instead of a positive charge. So a hydride shift, you're moving a hydrogen and its two electrons over one carbon in order to make a more stable carbocation. Right, so that's what we started talking about. Um, we also see if it's anything that's larger than a methyl, we can't see this. But if if you do have a quaternary carbon next to a carbocation, you can actually move over an entire methyl group in order to do this. And we wouldn't that wouldn't be our first choice. If we have a hydrogen, we're going to move the hydrogen first because it's so much smaller than a whole methyl group. But if the carbon that's next to your carbocation only has other carbons attached, we don't have a hydrogen there. So we can't just move an, a hydride over. We have to move the entire methyl group over. So we can have a methyl shift if there is no hydrogen to move. All right. So and we're out of time, but I'm going to go through this one really quick, and then we'll talk about why it is in uh, in lab. If we wanted to know what type of shift would happen, here we have a secondary carbocation. It's next to an. It has two hydrogens next to it on one side. On the other side, you've got a methyl and another hydrogen. So 
first off, will this rearrange? And actually maybe for, that's not the best option for first off because if we wanna know if it's going to rearrange, we need to know whether or not we can make something more stable. So we've got a positive charge on a secondary carbon. If we can turn that into a positive charge on a tertiary carbon by only moving one hydrogen or one methyl, then we will. So if we move either of these two hydrogens, we get the same molecule back, right? We still get a secondary carbocation. So there's no energy energetic force towards towards that. There's going to be no benefit to doing that. So we won't move either of these protons over. If we move something from this carbon, we can either move a hydrogen over and then that puts a positive charge here, right? On a tertiary carbocation. Or we just learned we can move a methyl over, but if we moved a methyl over, we'd still have a secondary carbocation, right? We wouldn't be making it any more stable. And plus a methyl shift is much slower than a hydrogen shift. So if we have a hydrogen to move, that's what we'll move. So we're gonna move the electrons for this carbon hydrogen bond over and the hydrogen follows with it. So our product would look like We, we made a new bond over here with the hydrogen. You wouldn't necessarily have to draw the hydrogen, um, but it can be helpful to remind yourself what moved over. And that means that we had a positive charge is now on a tertiary carbon. All right, so again, these are the trickiest ones to see whether or not it will do that or to recognize even if I give you the steps. Um, but they do follow predictable rules once you get your your head wrapped around that. All right. 